Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to The Megan Kelly Show. Oh my gosh, I'm excited for today's show. This is something I know absolutely nothing about, but it's popping up here, there, and everywhere. And I, if you're like me and you've never taken a magic mushroom and you don't know anything about it, but you're hearing the buzz about this psilocybin, um, you know, there's also LSD. I get it. I have the same associations with those, at least LSD that you might as the children of the 70s. Um, but this is growing and growing in popularity under controlled settings because it's proving to be a game changer, a game changer when it comes to things like depression, anxiety, um, even potentially addiction, anorexia, smoking. I mean, we're going to go down the list of things that this drug is potentially helping with and the studies that are, that are being done on it now, thanks to our guest today. Now, psilocybin is a naturally occurring, um, basically, compound that you can find in these magic mushrooms, and it affects the central nervous system. I know what you're thinking, okay, but it's not about getting high. It's really not. It is about treating some of these problems that a lot of people have. My God, have you seen the latest stats on anxiety and depression? Studies have shown that psilocybin has great potential when it comes to depression, alcohol, addiction, uh, smoking. We could go down the list. Eating disorders, as I mentioned. OCD, potentially. Um, here to discuss all of this is the expert on the topic and the author of many of these studies, Dr. Roland Griffiths. Now, Roland is not a Timothy Leary, the guy at Harvard back in the 60s who was like getting, he was taking the mushrooms just right alongside his patients and kind of fell into disgrace. Roland is a straight arrow. He is a man of science who came about this very professionally and scientifically and had never taken a magic mushroom or done any of this, but said this, this is an avenue that could potentially help a lot of patients. He'd been at Hopkins researching how to, how to treat addictions and things like that. Uh, he went to Hopkins right as soon as he got his uh, degree back in, I think, 1972. And now, as of 2019, they created a whole center around our guest today, the first and only, I think only, but definitely first in the country um, that is devoted to studying these psychedelics. He's the director of the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Roland now, at this point, also has firsthand experience in connection with psychedelics, a wealth of stories and a fascinating background. He is the expert on this topic. I want to talk to you about the amazing Extreme Altitude Wines from the Bonner Private Wine Partnership. They are back with an amazing offer for our audience. It's winter, as you know, and these flavors go great with any hearty meal. Love the hearty meals in the winter. And any meat that you may be serving up in particular. They're unlike any wine that you have ever tasted. Blackberry, leather, smoke, little dark cherry in there. The wines are almost impossible to get on your own. The producers deep in the Andes Mountains make limited quantities. And today, I have an amazing offer for you. If you visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash MKS, you will not only get wine for over 50% off, plus free shipping, but you will also get a bonus bottle of small batch limited production wine from their exclusive wine cellar. That's four bottles for the price of three. It's a deal that's hard to turn down if you are a wine lover, like I am. They've cut out the middleman, so you're not going to pay a big markup. Just visit bonnerprivatewines.com slash MKS. Bonner spelled B-O-N-N-E-R, okay? Bonnerprivatewines.com slash MKS to claim your bonus bottle and become a part of America's most unique wine club. Welcome to the show, Roland. So nice to have you here. Oh, thank, thanks so much, Megan. I'm delighted to be here. What a background. So I, I will tell you that we have a friend who first tried, mm. and I realize this is different, ketamine to help him with his mm. depression a couple of years ago. And my husband and I were like, that sounds nuts. What's he talking about? He was under the care of a psychiatrist. And so he did it in the psychiatrist's office. And he started talking to us about how it really changed his outlook on life and really helped him with his depression. And we were thinking, you know, my husband and I are pretty straight-laced. I mean, I, I've never, I was telling my team before we came, came on the air, I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never done marijuana. I've, I've drank alcohol. That's it. So 
to me, I'm like, what are you doing? You're taking some like some mind altering substance and with your psychiatrist this is a bad psychiatrist. He's, he's failing <laughs> at the, the normal ways that he's supposed to help you. So these, these were all my biases before I came to it. Then, then more and more people started talking about this. And all the while you've been researching this as a scientist and not somebody who's into recreational drugs at Johns Hopkins of all places, one of, if not the most respected medical institution we have. So let's go back to little Roland, um, young <laughs> Roland in uh, the, the 1970s. And when you first started at Hopkins, what, what were you thinking about it? Like, what was your goal as a young scientist to study there? Hmm. Yeah, uh, well, th thanks, Megan. Um, let's see, so I was trained uh, at University of Minnesota in psychopharmacology, which is this cross-disciplinary field of psychology and pharmacology, uh, and came from that to Johns Hopkins, where we were doing research with mood altering drugs. And then initially I was working both in the animal laboratory and the human laboratory, very interested primarily in drugs of abuse. And so for years, I'm, I'm now a full professor in the departments of psychiatry and neuroscience at Hopkins. And for years, my research program focused on uh, abusable compounds. Uh, and we developed models for assessing drug abuse. We're very interested in subjective effects. Uh, and I worked with uh, a whole variety of different types of compounds from sedative hypnotics to stimulus, cocaine, amphetamine, uh, dissociative anesthetics like ketamine, dextromethorphine, uh, hallucinogens, uh, et cetera. Um, and so that was kind of my life uh, course. Uh, and then <laughs> and then interestingly, about 25 years ago, I undertook a meditation practice. And uh, there was something that was intriguing to me about exploring inner states. And I realized that I didn't have any strong orientation at all toward that. Uh, and uh, as I got more deeply involved with meditation, I started to have some very unique experiences that um, were unlike anything I had experienced before, uh, and which struck me as profound. Uh, and, I, and frankly, I didn't know what to make of them. Uh, it, it had overtones of what people report it as spiritual experiences uh, but I, I I couldn't I couldn't quite figure it out I started reading about different meditation traditions di uh, experiences that come out of religious traditions and then I stumbled upon the older research from the 1950s and 60s on the psychedelics and there that result that that research, uh, suggested that psychedelics could produce some of these same kinds of interesting experiences. And so at that time, well, let's let's just kind of put it in in perspective. So psychedelics had been actually pretty extensively studied in the 50s and 60s, not and and early 70s, but not according to the methods that we would use uh, today. Uh, but then, as we all know, the psychedelic 60s happened, uh, and uh, these drugs were widely used, misused under a variety of conditions. Media uh, really took that and emphasized what really sounded like to all of us within the culture that this was very bad news, uh, very often emphasizing catastrophic catastrophic outcomes, uh, people killing themselves or jumping out of buildings or burning their eyes out, looking in the sun. Uh, and then there was a whole narrative about chromosome damage. And what that resulted in is uh, a, a, a functional shutdown of all human research uh, with these compounds, which is 
a fascinating thing to contemplate in and of itself because uh, it it's actually so unusual that an area of science gets closed down altogether. But what happened was the Nixon administration started this war on drugs. All of the drugs out of that category, these psychedelics or hallucinogens, as they were known then, uh, went into Schedule One, the most restrictive schedule there is uh, in terms of regulation. Uh, the funding, federal funding, uh, disappeared uh, completely. FDA stopped approving new research protocols. And within academics, uh, it really became uh, an area that you you didn't want to express any interest in because it immediately <clears throat> raised suspicions about, yeah, who are you and why are you interested in this? And isn't that a goofy thing to be uh, doing, right. in fact, I think. Right, the like do we have another Timothy I... Leary on our hands? And and yeah. it's it's yeah. been stigmatized. And only now is that, yeah. I mean, I came, as I say, I came into the the subject with that same judgment, you know, like that's, what do you mean? That's a hardcore drug. Who would do that hardcore drug? Now, I remember hearing Steve Jobs saying that he did a bunch of LSD when he was younger and he thought more people should do LSD. And, you know, that man created the iPhone. So you've got to think, well, maybe it does unlock an area <laughs> of consciousness that the rest of us would like to access, but it's really just for trailblazers. And yet, maybe not. So, so you're still in the in the camp of only the weird people are kind of looking at that, and that's what my industry thinks of this. But I'm in this lane of study that could lead me there. I mean, it might be an interesting thing to study. So you did the meditation. You got kind of into a mystical world here and there, like sort of a light bulb went goes off for you. Yeah. And then was that it? Was it after that that you said I'm I'm going to take the leap and actually propose a study on this? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Uh, this kind of the thought of investigating inner life uh, was uh, new to me, uh, frankly. And and here I was, a full professor at Hopkins with an international reputation for conducting research on mood altering drugs. And now here was a set of compounds that had not been touched for decades because. Uh, we had essentially outlawed research with them. Uh, and and I thought, geez, that, that would be really interesting to study. Now, it was not at all clear I could get approval for that kind of right. research uh, because it has to go through a very strict ethical review at my hop at at the institution level and that's Johns Hopkins and then of course it needs FDA approval and DEA approval um, mm. but I was in principle interested enough to give it a try and I going into that process I thought maybe I had a 50 percent chance of getting it approved I, at that point I really started going back into the literature and thought we could conduct these studies safely, uh, but couldn't know that for certain. Uh, and the thing that I really want to say is I'm really proud of Johns Hopkins as an institution because there's there was institutional risk for any academic center greenlighting uh, research of this type, just because if it if it pulled in media attention. Uh, it, it's going to raise the specter mm. of Timothy Leary and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. uh, Hopkins weighed the risk-benefit ratios, put apart the, you know, the political or media risk that they would might undertake as an institution and approve the protocol. And and it w was very very carefully reviewed and by the dean of the medical school and the Hopkins managing attorney as well as this review board, but they they approved it. And ultimately, so did FDA and DEA. And so we ran this first study. And Megan, I have to say that, I mean, the results for me were astonishing. Uh, and just to correct the, the record here, I, I had a 
what I'd consider a, a couple of trivial experiences with psychedelics in the 1960s growing up. Nothing that was meaningful, nothing that caught my attention. Uh, and so, so, uh, so I just, I don't want to claim to have been completely naive, but it was, it was absolutely not something that I had any uh, affinity toward. And if anything, I would characterize myself as having been a skeptic at the time. And, and, and there, you know, there were people in the culture that were very pro psychedelics. And, I have to say, I was, I was, I was suspicious of them. So, mm -hmm. so I'm going into this research like that. I did partner with a clinical psychologist, Bill Richards, who had extensive therapeutic experience with psychedelics back when they were legal. So he handled the clinical front. I was the skeptical scientist going into this. And this, just it's to a, jump in, this is uh, this is the 2006 study. Is this what you're talking correct. about? Correct. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and can, so, before and, before we get to that, before we get to that, let me just take one step back because I do think the study, the stuff you were doing before that, is interesting too. And studying things that are addictive that people are struggling struggling with all over America right now. Many of the listeners to the show are going to be interested in this. Things like alcohol, caffeine, or nic caffeine, nicotine, and in addition to some of the other drugs you mentioned. So just b before we get into the psychedelics, do you have um? Do you have a couple words on which of those is the most addictive and sort of the most pernicious, like the toughest one to to attack? And this, like, the, whatever you do, don't take that first cigarette versus the first drink or the first. I don't know. Oh. I'm just curious in your <laughs> overall thoughts of addictive properties. Yeah. Um, this, uh, let's see. That's it, there's no there's no simple answer to that because the um, the probability that someone is going to become dependent depends on the set setting context and the availability of the compound so the actually the the drug that more people in the world are dependent on and and uh and many would object to using the word addicted to uh is caffeine uh, but it's the world's most widely used mood altering drug and it turns out that it does produce physical and psychological dependence if you use it daily at any any kind of dose above uh you know a pretty small cup of coffee it's very likely you have developed low level physical dependence and what the pickup the sense of a wakefulness that occurs in the morning is in part due to suppression of low grade withdrawal uh, symptoms that you have mm. fatigue or tiredness or kind of muzzy headedness uh, being suppressed by that morning cup of coffee. Uh, and, so, <laughs> and so in that sense, in a culture in which caffeine is freely available, uh, you know, people are going to much more likely become uh, dependent on that. And, and that actually I, I ended up doing a lot of research on caffeine because it was kind of a model system for understanding how drugs come to the capture and control behavior. And actually, mm -hmm. at the time that we did that, interestingly, the soft drink companies were saying that they were adding caffeine as a flavor enhancer. And that oh, was the wow. only reason they did it. <laughs> and that story, wow. you know, in retrospect, looks very much like what the cigarette in industry was claiming about nicotine. Oh no, nicotine's a flavor additive. <laughs> and it's wow. not, it's addictive. Caffeine is, it's much lesser so. You know, but if you really want to talk about kind of perniciousness, uh, then, I mean, we have the opiate crisis to look at uh, right now. It's very hard to back out of that. I mean, cigarette smoking is uh, is very addictive uh, when when available culturally as it has been uh the stimulants cocaine and uh uh and those sorts of drugs uh have a relatively high addiction potential many of the sedative hypnotics and sleeping medications and sedatives also what's a sedative uh, hypnotic it, well yeah like um in in the old days it was barbiturates uh 
but uh, even uh, some of the popular sleeping medications, they're not highly addictive in the sense that uh, there's social de degradation that goes along with it. But one can easily become dependent on those drugs. And, the, and so, and these are also the anxiolytics, the uh, uh, anxiety reducing drugs. So, mm. things like, uh, you know, Valium, uh, mm. diazepam, and, uh, and those, those sorts of things. And, and people can easily get dependent on that with physical dependence. And it can be very, very difficult to get off of them. As it can, I, I think be what you said the of, about the uh, the morning cup of ca uh, coffee is very interesting. So if you when you feel better drinking that coffee, it may just be you suppressing your withdrawal symptoms, not an actual pick me up. Like if you could break the habit, you might feel as good as you feel post that cup of coffee every morning without that cup of coffee. That's a, <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> And it now wow. it doesn't mean that caffeine. So if you're if you're caffeine naive, ca caffeine even low doses of caffeine will have a stimulant effect. But your your body adapts to that very quickly. One of, what so one of the interesting things that we showed in the course of that research is that caffeine is behaviorally active at doses far lower than anyone ever knew previously. So a cup of coffee, and now I'm talking, I'm not talking about a big Starbucks cup of coffee. I'm talking about a six ounce cup of coffee. Usually delivers about a hundred milligrams of caffeine. And many people can detect the effects of caffeine at doses of less than 20 milligrams and many 10 or less milligrams. So that's a wow. couple of sips of coffee can what? produce reliable detectable subjective effects. And these are really rigorous blinded studies. So we know this to be the case, but it was actually on the basis of people not having studied those lower thresholds before that the soft drink companies could claim, oh yeah, this is yeah below the behaviorally active range. And, and, and since then they've kind of fessed up, they now label how much caffeine is in there product but at the time they were denying uh any phys any physi physiological effect of of importance but as it wow. yeah it turns out we we certainly now understand that that soft drinks ca caffeinated soft drinks you know if, if you take a couple of them a day you're kind of now in the range of developing physical dependence on them and it's so amazing how many that, drugs surround us. You know, the soft drinks and the coffee, not to mention the cigarettes and the alcohol everywhere and the people taking the sleeping pills and then the coffee to wake themselves up and so on. All these drugs, really not that great for you. And yet here's this little class of drugs over here that's been so demonized, you know, the the, the drugs that, that you've been studying that we're not allowed to touch. You're not even allowed to research them. That could be, do appear to be, revolutionary in attacking major mental health challenges like depression and anxiety and beyond. So it's crazy how our medical system works, right? Like they're dumping the more caffeine into the sodas, but you're not even allowed to look into psilocybin. Don't you touch that because people could get hurt. Okay. That's America. All right. So let's keep going. Um, so 2006, you get the approval. Everybody's watching you closely and you take a look at psilocybin in, um, okay. This is the headline. Psilocybin can occasion mystical type experiences, having substantial and sustained, that's important, personal meaning and spiritual significance. So was that study on just regular folks? Who, who, is, who are the subjects of that? Uh, they were just healthy volunteers who had never before taken a psychedelic drug. <laughs> and so uh, we, we wanted to recruit people who were uh, psychedelic naive because we didn't want a bias put in at, right at the beginning because if someone had tried psychedelics and liked them, then they're very likely to report <laughs> good, good effects from them. If they had tried psychedelics and had an awful, awful time, they probably wouldn't enroll in the study. And you could, so you can imagine what kind of biases that would create. 
So we went in with these psychedelic naive individuals, and then we furthermore just bent over backwards to to make the drug as blinded as we could do so practically and ethically uh, in terms of not giving people strong expectations of what they might experience. And then the the way we prepared people is we would have about eight hours of clinical contact time before the session. The session involved a rather high dose of of, uh, psilocybin or another drug we were comparing it to, uh, Ritalin or methylphenidate at a a high dose under otherwise blinded uh, conditions. And then people come in uh, for the session day into Johns Hopkins, into a room that's decorated you know it's living room like there's a there's a couch and chairs and art on the wall and uh and during that session people take a capsule containing the drug yes there's a picture of it uh they take a capsule containing uh, the drug they're in the presence of two therapists or sitters or uh or guides as they're sometimes called and the and the purpose there is just to act, to to uh, to let the person go inward and have their own experience. So people are laying on the couch after taking this. They have headphones through which they're listening to music. They have eye shades uh, just to have them go inward. And the and the support the therapists or the guides or the sitters are there just to provide a safe container for them to have their own experience. Mm -hmm. And the basic instruction is very simple. It's just go in, explore, see what comes up. You're safe. Uh, We're, yeah, we're here to, uh, to uh, support you. Uh, But it's not guided in the sense that people are going in uh, with a problem to work on now yeah, with yeah, a therapeutic. Yeah. Let, let me ask you a couple, let me ask you a yeah. couple of quick questions just so we can get yeah. the outlines of this. Uh, how long after you take the capsule does it kick in? Uh, by 30 minutes, most people are beginning to feel effects, sometimes as early as 10 to 15 minutes. It reaches okay. peak effect at about two to three hours. Oh and then boy, that was my tapering. second question. So, What's like, that? how long is this experience? How long do you should you plan on it's being a, out of It's a day long session. So, people, uh, uh, as I said, they usually come in. They take the capsule at, at between eight and nine. Uh, the peak effects are occurring two to three hours later, and by four in the afternoon, they're pretty well back down to baseline. Uh, oh. They complete they drive some questionnaires. Home. Uh, no, they're not allowed to drive home. They they need to a pickup a person, a family member or friend, who will accompany them home and uh, and make sure they're they're doing fine for the by the next rest day. Of the could they operate heavy machinery? The, then yes, they they could. Uh, and, and but we ask them to come in the next day. We want to interview them the, yeah, the next yeah. day. Make sure they're. They're okay, but there's no. I'm just trying to get my before we get to the effects and all that. I'm just trying to get to the the sort of the setup. Did you ever have? Yeah. And has has it ever happened that somebody like ran screaming and yelling out of the room, like "Oh my god!" Like an yeah. unexpected re- reaction. Yeah. Sh- yes. Yeah. Oh. I mean, really? Uh, no, not running and screaming out of the room. That's so. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've never had that, but <laughs> we, we've had people uh, that might have liked to go run and scream and get out of the room. Uh, and that's the very purpose of developing this uh, this relationship of trust and support uh, because th- those therapist guide sitters can ground people. And, and And we do a lot to prepare people for what they might encounter. And we give them a lot of instructions about how to navigate that experience and and that's and that's that's very important critically important because there really are risks associated with taking these compounds particularly 
under unsupervised conditions because mm. people can't matter of fact the the most common and probable bad outcome is that people will have some kind of panic attack and then they'll engage in some kind of dangerous behavior and mm. and and that can be that can turn very ugly people uh can uh, commit suicide homicide but more often they're confused they're uh panicked they could run out into the street they could just get themselves uh into into trouble and this so this is there, why we do not really do this alone that, you do not go pick the mushroom in your backyard and eat it you do this under the care of a professional if you do it at all well that's certainly my inclination but as you know there are state initiatives now city initiatives uh that are moving toward decriminalization and legalization and so w one of my concerns is that our culture not get ahead of what we know to safely protect people mm -hmm. and then as long as we're on you know all the the dangers of of these compounds so number one is that um is uh, panic behavior, but that's just more probable. A worse outcome is that it appears that some vulnerable people can develop long-term psychotic disorders. So someone in the in their probably early 20s, uh, if they have a vulnerability towards schizophrenia, the concern mm. is, and, and we, we, we actually don't have scientific proof of this, but we have enough case reports to make make me believe it uh the concern is that someone that already has a tendency towards psychotic disorder that exposure to these kinds of compounds might be enough just to push them over the edge and there's wow. no returning from a diagnosis of schizophrenia once that's in play that's a lifelong condition and that's oh horrible gosh. and so we go way overboard in terms of screening people as much as we possibly can uh, who might have such tendencies. So, so we disallow people to enroll if they even have a second degree relative with a, with a history of schizophrenia. That may be mm -hmm. overly conservative, but uh, it's, it's a real risk. And, and in the in the widespread cultural enthusiasm that we have right now, I think it's mm, being be underplayed. And Would I'm that very be something, Roland, that you could tell, but before the person left the room at the end of the day? Would you be able to tell, oh my God, he crossed over? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we, so we've never had uh, any volunteer develop long-term uh, psychotic uh, illness. People can be destabilized because of the magnitude of the effects. So that, uh, but that that's 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 very low. I mean, our the incidents in which we have had to do aftercare, and we now have treated, I think it's four hundred, almost five hundred people, four hundred and eighty, I think, uh, and uh, uh, and the the incidents in which we've had to support people after after exposure to psilocybin is kind of very, very small. I mean, I think okay. we could count, count them in, on one hand. And what that meant for those people is that they required some additional counseling afterwards above and beyond what we would have normally uh, provided. So we certainly haven't had any enduring psychotic processes but, but to me this you know, is like this is this is further evidence that forget the mushroom in your backyard that's in a class of its own but like colorado and oregon which are now oregon's making this it has made this legal um and colorado's on its way they're saying okay you'd have to go to a clinic to get it but who am i getting at the clinic is it like some 24 year old guy who had this experience himself and he's just going to hold my hand or am i going to get somebody like a roland disciple who actually knows the right questions to ask if I'm a 24-year-old man with schizophrenia in my family history. That's, you know, now we're on sketchy ground. Yeah. So the training of the of the therapist is, is crucial to assuring maximal positive outcome. 
And and frankly, you know, thus far we don't have FDA approval of any of these compounds, but it, it looks like it's forthcoming. But uh, and and so there, then these drugs will be available for uh, uh, for medical uh, under medical conditions. But I don't think the FDA. I know the FDA has not yet settled specifically on what kind of training requirements are, are going to be mm. necessary in order to, to offer this kind of therapy. And and you can be sure that it's going to be much stricter within the. Uh, the structure of the medical system than it's going to be at the at the state level, and so the state level training is I ha- I haven't looked into it closely, but my sense is that that the quality of the therapist could vary widely uh, in terms of how how good they are, and uh, and so that's a it's a it's a source of uh, of con- concern, uh, sure, frankly. Sure. Yeah. All right. So let, let me do this. I want to talk about what, what you found in 2006 and now where it is today, because you did a truly groundbreaking work after that that's advanced this understanding of people who are suffering from cancer, people who are, I mean, think about what cancer victims go through, not only the diagnosis and the fear of end of life, but the treatments, which can be so devastating. So Roland did another study on folks like that. Uh, we're going to get into all of it when we come back with Dr. Roland Griffiths in two minutes. You got to check out private internet access, okay? Would you ever hand over your laptop or your phone to a stranger and ask them to take a quick look at your browsing history? Probably not. That's an invasion of your privacy. It's none of their business. And yet, someone out there knows absolutely everything you do online, (gasps) whether you like it or not, and it's your internet service provider. Now, if you want to stop internet service providers from always looking over your shoulder, secretly judging you, I don't know if that's true, but they are secretly looking over your shoulder and profiting off of your data, you need private internet access. With over 30 million downloads, this is the perfect software for staying private online as it hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection. Private internet access is really easy to use, and one subscription can protect up to 10 devices at once. As a public figure, keeping my own private life private is very important to me. So I love tools like this. And if you want to enjoy all the benefits of private internet access, now is the time to subscribe. Go to piavpn.com, piavpn.com slash Megan and get an 83% discount. Seriously, 83% off. That's just $2.03 a month for this protection. And you also get four extra months totally free. But you must go to piavpn.com, piavpn.com slash Megan for a truly private digital life. Last time, piavpn.com slash M-E-G-Y-N. Okay, Roland, so you take in a bunch of healthy people, you subject them to a bunch of questioning, you set the table for um, the experiment, they take the capsules, and what did you find? Well, let's see. So psilocybin, as we certainly expected, <clears throat> produced the whole array of psychedelic-like effects. So there's visual phenomena, visual distortions, visual imagery comes up. There may be greater emotionality, and that can be uh, very positive, sometimes transcendent-like experiences, but also experiences of fear or or, uh, or you know, un- unstabilizing kinds of experiences, um, and uh, and then there can be somatic effects. The sense of body has changed, uh, and there can also be cognitive uh, changes, uh, and uh, and so people can th- think and imagine different things, and including uh, including. Uh, some paranoid thinking that comes that's very low but that can occur so all those all those kinds of effects occurred and then at the end of the day we gave people a a whole set of questionnaires uh, and one set of questionnaires had been developed uh, 
originally to measure mystical experiences uh, brought about naturally. These are religious type of mystical experiences. Uh, and we've since refined that questionnaire and we call it the mystical experience questionnaire. But what was really interesting is that people endorsed very highly the components of, of uh, mystical experience that had been described by religious people throughout the ages uh, in terms of discussing these. And we could talk about the qualities of those, but the, you know, the key quality is this uh, a sense of connectedness to to everything, uh, and and that can be experienced uh, as a connection with the divine in in religious uh, terminology. It doesn't doesn't have to be, but so there's a sense of the interconnectedness of all things that we're all in this together. There's a sense that that experience is precious. It's um, to put in religious language, it's sacred or deserving of reverence. And then another feature is that the experience feels authentically true. And people have these experiences and and say it feels more real than everyday waking reality. So those are the features. They they came out, uh, you know, but by the end of the day, those become memories, right? Now here's what was astonishing to me. I, I, at this point in my career, I had assessed a lot of people at high doses of all kinds of different psychoactive drugs, and so I, so I, uh, I know how to measure subjective effects. I know what to expect from them. Uh, and here's what was interesting: people would come back two months later because the way the study was designed, there were two or three sessions, so they're coming back. Two months later, uh, preparing for a second session, and I sit down and I ask them, "Well, what, you know, what do you remember about that? You know, your first session." And the people who got psilocybin, I was blinded to who received what, but the people who got psilocybin would say, "Oh, I remember that like it was yesterday." Uh, that was what. That's one of the most important experiences of my life. <laughs> and I had, and so here I, I'm a skeptic. I've, n- I've I've now heard stories about psychedelics, uh, but I w- I wasn't prepared for that. What so what does it mean? This was one of the most important experiences of your life, and so my immediate <laughs> my immediate judgmental reaction was, what kind of life has this person <laughs> person had? It, but no, they would say, well. You know, it's on par with the, you know, the death of my parent just recently. My father passed, you know, or the um, the birth of my firstborn child. Um, and you go, what? This this was a six hour session in a in a in a faux living room like environment at Johns Hopkins, and it's among the most meaningful experiences of your life and indeed that's that's kind of the core finding that there's something about these experiences that are remarkable in terms of how they're imprinted and remembered and then the attributions that people make to those experiences so i'd never i'd never seen anything like that it hadn't occurred to me when we started the study even to assess for something like that. And then we started developing scales. How important is this experience on a life, you know, lifetime of experiences from, you know, like an everyday experience to goes up to, you know, within the 10 most meaningful experience of my life, five or the single most. Well, yeah, in that study, and then there was something about spirituality, in that study, 30% of the people said that the experience was the single most spiritually significant experience of their entire life. Wow. And about 80% of people in those studies mm-hmm. say it's in the top five most meaningful and spiritual significant oh, uh, of their goodness. lives. 
And that's what, that. Can I, can I just ask you, like, back up, back up a little bit? Because yeah. when you're describing what they're experiencing, now I want to know, you know, how, how did it get so significant? I, I'm picturing what you see when you look through a kaleidoscope. I'm picturing, you know, 1970s TV animations, you know, <laughs> um, Picasso's. This is, what I, this is what's coming to mind as the images that would be flashing through your head with the eye mask on. Not it? Like, what? what's actually it, being seen? <laughs> well, one of the features, Megan, of these experiences that de defines them is that they're ineffable. The, the first thing that people say is that I, I can't even describe it. And so what you just described were, were experiences all in the visual realm, but this goes beyond that. There may be people who have no visions at all, but yet these experiences take on that sense of, of meaning. So I don't think we understand well enough, and certainly our neuroscience isn't refined well enough to know yeah, precisely what components of these experiences result in this uh, incredible meaning making. And, but in terms of visualization, I mean, that can show up in in innumerable different ways uh and it, it can it can show up just as a carnival like you know atmosphere uh but you know it can also you know turn to sacred you know s sacred imagery uh you know or a, a sense of approaching something that is just beyond description and so for religiously inclined they might they might use the word god and encounter with so you with don't god. you don't have to steer them so if uh, and i'm getting a little ahead of myself but if you're going to use this to help somebody with stopping smoking or uh addressing their anorexia do you have to steer them like we're going to conquer the smoking picture the cigarette you know or and, or even in this study well, forget that. Let me start again. If you're dealing with depression, do you need to sort of yeah. say, we're going to focus on your depression so that you're kind of pushing them toward resolving the thing you're targeting? Yeah, great. <laughs> great questions. Um, let's see. So in therapeutic studies, there's uh, a built-in intention for the, the, for the, the session, and that is good. it's going to be helpful for them in terms of managing uh, whatever therapeutic condition they have. Now, uh, now there's also uh, research underway for approval of MDMA or ecstasy for treatment of PTSD. And now, the, and that's a, it's not a classic psychedelic, it's kind of like psychedelics though, but, but there, the therapy session very <clears throat> explicitly uh, focuses on, or the expectation is that people are going to talk about their traumatic experience. Mm. With a drug like psilocybin, we don't invite people to talk at all. I mean, if, and so if some people are moved to talk, uh, we'll listen. But very often, <laughs> uh, as soon as you start putting something in the ineffable range into words, it pulls you out of the experience. Yeah. So our That's... counsel to people is to just stay with the experience. Just trust trust the process. Be interested and curious about it. Think about that. So the if somebody goes in, and we'll talk about the anxiety, depression, but somebody goes in to do this to see if it'll help with depression, and then you don't have to direct them. The mind knows what to do it it like trust in your in your mind and your soul and the psilocybin working their magic without any specific push or direction that to me is so remarkable so we'll talk about what's happening you know what's actually happening physically in your brain what is doing this and what's the difference between psilocybin and ketamine and mdn md mdma uh and all the like does it matter? You know, you should take LSD or does it matter? So anyway, we have a lot more to get to, uh, including the remarkable lasting effects of these sessions and how you might be able to get one. Dr. Roland Griffith sticks around for the whole show today. We're lucky to have him.
And remember, folks, you can find The Megyn Kelly Show live on Sirius XM Triumph Channel 111 every weekday at noon east. The full video is available and the clips, those are fun to look at, uh, over at youtube.com slash Megyn Kelly. If you prefer an audio podcast, go on over and subscribe, follow, download, wherever. They keep changing the words. Do it on Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher. They're all free. Uh, so if you miss something, you want to hear this show or you want to share it with a loved one later, go ahead and do it via podcast and you could listen there to our full archives, more than 480 shows now. My kids are just saying, remember when you hit 100 and we celebrated. Now we're almost at 500. We'll have to have another celebration then. What's your gift going to be this Valentine's Day? How about taking 10 or 15 years off your appearance with Genucel Skincare and their most popular package? And right now, every most popular package, all their best stuff, is 70% off, 70, and includes the next breakthrough in skincare technology, Genucel's Probiotic Moisturizer, absolutely free. These super ingredients found in yogurt can have the same nourishing benefits and goodness for your skin right? You eat the yogurt, you get the probiotic, and you can do this on your skin too with probiotic extracts that can target bad bacteria on the surface of your skin to restore balance to your skin's microbiome for a noticeably clearer complexion and visibly younger appearance. See those fine lines, wrinkles, dark spots, sagging jawline, even bags and puffiness visibly disappear right before your eyes thanks to Genucel. Plus, with its immediate effects product, see results in under 12 hours guaranteed or your money back. Go to genucel.com slash MK60 right now. And for the first time ever, every order at genucel.com from now through Valentine's Day will include a beauty box with two, count them, two luxury gifts for free. Order now, two weeks only, genucel.com slash MK60, G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash MK60. Zero. So Roland, um, we're talking about the sustained benefit to those who participated in the study in terms of their world experience. I mean, they're rating it up here when it comes to most meaningful events in their lives. So, but what did that do for them? So it, you know, like the birth of my three children, they were all very meaningful and they you know, I remember them very fondly, but what do they do for me as a human? Well, when I ruminate on them, I, I'm filled with warmth and feelings of goodness and connection. What's, what does this do for these folks? Yeah, um, <clears throat> a great, yeah, great question. Uh, let's see, so the, the meaning that people take from these experiences is going to be very much intertwined with the set and setting, the kind of intention that people brought into the experience and the support that they receive after the experience in terms of making use of that. <clears throat> but if if we take just the uh, healthy volunteers that had this experience, uh, so many of them end up reporting, and this is, in, in fact, it's years later, they continue to use this as a touchstone uh, experience, much in the same way that, that you might relate to the, the birth of your children. And, and for me, <laughs> this is very relatable. My number one most meaningful experience was the birth of my first child, my daughter, and and for me, that changed my worldview. I, I came, I came to an understanding of what the human race was truly about, and it was uh, it's magnificent, and I wouldn't trade it uh, for anything. Uh, uh, so, what did it mean to them? Yeah, very often, people made. I don't want to say similar kinds of attributions, but they they really felt that they had a new view of the world, a new worldview, a different sense of self, often one that was felt to be more interconnected, more alive in the in the world. Um, it's yeah, it's very hard to draw generalities, but I think there's a positivity that comes out out of this a sense of self-efficacy that they have real choices to make in their lives and they end up making 
what appear to be positive choices about their lives going forward. And that's, in fact, why we think this has cross-diagnostic generality with respect to treatment of very divergent kinds of psychiatric disorders. And that's because mm-hmm. you fundamentally change a worldview and and someone's sense that they can make a difference, that they can change themselves. And that and that's why in the therapeutic context, these experiences are often set within a therapeutic framework. So to give you an example, the work that we've done at Johns Hopkins on cigarette smoking, this was led by uh, my colleague, Matt Johnson. Uh, Cigarette smoking is a very difficult uh, habit to break, addiction to break. And people come in having failed multiple times to uh, quit smoking. And essentially, they're self-labeling themselves as an addicted smoker. And they have reason for doing that. And this kind of experience uh, and, and, and telling them how they can approach quitting going forward, but this kind of experience frees them from that self-identified label as being addicted. And so people can come out saying, well, yeah, I have failed many, many times. But in fact, I can put up with a little suffering. I can put up with the discomfort of of quitting. I realize that that's going to be transient, and I'm committed, you know, to the objective of being smoke free. And so it's it's enough to push people into a cycle of making choices that benefit them going forward. And so I think that it would be true in many respects with eating disorders and. Uh, depression and anxiety and depression and cancer patients. So how many sessions do you need to go to and how long are the results? How long do the results last? Yeah. So uh, our, we've done studies with single sessions. So a single high dose of psilocybin uh, appears to be efficacious. We've also done studies with... Uh, uh, two or three sessions. Uh, I, I think when this is initially medically approved, I'm imagining it'll be initially for just a single a single session. Uh, but the, we're in our infancy in terms of understanding optimal use of these kinds of compounds and understanding at, at, a, at both a deep physiological, neurochemical level how they work but also at the psychological level, how they work and how these experiences can be best uh, packaged in a way to produce enduring change. So we're we're really just at the beginning of understanding this as a as a therapeutic intervention. Mm. And in terms of the duration, you know how what, how much bang you get for your buck? Well, that <laughs> I mean, it's astonishing. So so we the first study we ran was in uh, cancer patients who had a life-threatening cancer illness and they were anxious and depressed. And what we saw is rapid decrease in that anxiety and depression. We followed them out to six months. Another group at NYU that ran a very similar study did a five-year follow-up and and those results were sustained out to five years. Wow. you know, it, this is it's remarkable within the domain of treatment of psychiatric conditions, right? Because most psychiatric meds are temporary interventions. They're intervening, you know, to uh, well to to block a receptor or to enhance uh, something going on. You know, antidepressants are are given chronically over over a lifetime. Uh, and this is a single exposure in a single afternoon producing enduring changes for for years out. And, th- and if you think about it, if in fact it is that people have a different worldview, a different sense of self, they start changing their behavior themselves, then you can understand that that very well could be a process that endures in perpetuity. 
That is extraordinary. I mean, just to think about, as you point out, the number of antidepressants that people are taking and the self-medication they do with alcohol or drugs or what have you, and potentially one day could completely change the way you see things. Now, and I want to get into the cancer study in a little bit more detail, but before we do, can we just spend a minute on the differences between psilocybin, ketamine, LSD, and MDMA? Yeah. So uh, so psilocybin is what we call a classic psychedelic. <clears throat> and uh, other classic psychedelics, although they're not identical, but they're, they're more similar than not, are uh, LSD and DMT, which is in ayahuasca, used in South America. It's an admixture. Uh, it's also, it, it's also or, uh, uh, mescaline used by Native Americans in their religious ceremony. Uh, it's also a classic hallucinogen. So MDMA is, uh, is pharmacologically uh, different. It, it, it works at some of the same receptor systems but it's not a classic psychedelic. And it uh, it more than the classic psychedelics produces this you know, flooding of uh, empathetic response. And it, mm. it's very often felt to be a heart opener. But um, but it looks like it it's very useful in terms of treatment of post-traumatic stress. Uh, wow. And is that lasting? Stress. Now, Ketamine is an uh, entirely different compound. So that is a dissociative anesthetic. It's related to PCP, which is uh, not good. Uh, it, uh, it does produce these dissociative effects. It doesn't have some of the depth of meaning and, and, uh, and the, and the, or the colorfulness of uh, visualizations. Uh, uh, and it is physically addicting in the sense mm. that classic psychedelics are not. So uh, it produces a classic withdrawal syndrome. And so people can, if they get involved with ketamine, can increase the dose and become dependent on it. And uh, and that can be a result in, in tragic outcomes. However, ketamine is effective as an antidepressant, uh, but it differs from the classic psychedelics in that its effects are relatively short-lived. Uh, and so very often uh, people will emerge from their depressive uh, symptomatology, but that's only temporary. And over the course of a week or two weeks or a little bit more, uh, their depression will recur. Huh. So that's so why psilocybin ketamine sounds some... much better. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> much better than the than the ketamine. <laughs> well, they're 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 very different experiences, and uh, and I think uh, a high dose of psilocybin is likely to be more psychologically challenging than a high dose of uh, ketamine. Uh, so it's apples and oranges, really. Now, but I was joking with the team before we started about what kind of a difference could this make in one's personality and outlook? Like if I, if I were to go through this psilocybin or you mentioned MDNA or MDMA, the, the, the heart opener, would I come back on and say, you know, I really see Meghan Markle's point. Maybe it really is Prince William's fault. You know what I, would I start to <laughs> see, would it change my whole outlook on people? I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, no, I, Let's see. I think I think you would feel changed fundamentally, uh, oh. you know. And to what extent, you, you, what extent your major worldview would shift is un, is not is not uh, determined by by the drug. But I I don't have any. I don't. Well, I shouldn't say you specifically because I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where you would react within the spectrum. But 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 people feel changed, and they feel like the change and what they have learned from the experience is really a value, a very special mm. value to them. And so, <laughs> how, 
And you I think never know. People would put different words around, you know, how that changed them. I mean, yeah, if they're if they're happy in their life, otherwise, uh, they're not going to make radical uh, radical changes. Uh, but I'm sure all of us could. <laughs> All, all of us are not leaving, uh, living absolutely optimal lives. And so there's plenty of room for fine tuning. Yeah. So how does it work? I don't want to go too deep in the science because I think, you know, just a little will go a long way there. But what's it, what's, what's it doing to our brain to allow all of this to happen? <laughs> well, well, I, I, I'm, I wish we knew. Uh, we're not entirely ignorant. The, the basic neuroscience of this and, and our understanding of this is accumulating at an astonishing uh, rate, uh, but we're still deeply ignorant. So just very quickly, we know where drugs like psilocybin bind in the brain. We know what receptors they bind to, serotonin 2A. We know where those receptors are in brain. We know how those areas of the brain are activated or deactivated when someone takes psilocybin. We know something about the brain interconnectedness and how those patterns within the brain, what parts of the brain are talking to other parts. We know a little bit about how that uh, that's functioning under the influence of these uh, drugs, and, and and there's some suggestion that there's a down regulation of a system that's responsible for self referential processing, this kind of obsessionality that we have with ourselves. But there, the trail gets very thin because we're really talking at the core here about the nature of consciousness, the nature of our own experience, and how do we hold ourselves in the in the world? Who do we think we are? And uh, and yeah, we are we're in grade school, kindergarten, maybe uh, nursery school, uh, with respect to our understanding about that uh, from a from a reductionistic scientific standpoint, but because it's at this higher level psychological processing, uh, you know, about the sense of self and the sense of meaning, the sense of purpose, that's all getting intertwined in here in some way that feels magnificently profound and reorganizational. Uh, so, so mm. people will use the term "feeling reborn" uh, mm. in in a sense that things are new in a way that they hadn't experienced them before. But is there uh, a? I was going to say, is there a limit on how many of these sessions you can do? You know, is it does it does it cause brain damage if you go back too many times? No. So that's. Uh, that's important. With the classic psychedelics, they, they don't produce classic dependence. Uh, they don't produce physical dependence, although some people may want to take them again. But even if you want, even if someone wants to take them again, it's, it's generally months or years between uses, not days, and they're not habit forming in that sense. Uh, there was uh, a lot of concern about brain damage, and uh, and that appears not to be the case with the classic uh, psychedelics. It's more of an issue, uh, but that would be debatable, with clinical uh, doses of ketamine and MDMA. Uh, and uh, there is some literature about high-dose MDMA producing some uh, enduring neurological problems, but that's a that's an area of active debate. But that that's even not a within the debatable range with the classic hallucinogens. Hmm. Can should anyone try this? <laughs> Let's see. Well, I'm not going to recommend uh, they do so <laughs> unless it's in uh, you know under uh, a regulated protocol you know, that's been approved by the FDA and has the all the constraints built uh, uh, built into it. 
So, uh, so I, I think right now it's a uh, buyer beware, although our culture is making these drugs available. And, uh, and I don't know how that's going to roll out at the state levels and the, and the county levels, uh, uh, you know, but I, I certainly be reluctant to encourage anyone to, uh, uh, to seek that out unless they're very carefully screened. And we, we talked about uh, enduring psychotic illness. You certainly don't want that. And uh, and you'd like to be under optimal clinical care before, during, and after these sessions because they can be disorienting. And, uh, mm. and, and uh, you know, the motto is do do no harm so let's be very careful these are very powerful interventions but very promising wow so let's talk about the cancer patient study because that is a profound group of of people who are suffering mightily and if you want to talk about you know depression and people who are facing the end of their life who have to go through chemotherapy and radiation and so much, just so much heartache and physical ache at one time, that's where you'd go to find patients dealing with all of that. Um, When you went into that study, I read that you said something to the effect of, I really wanted to be careful because the last thing I wanted to do was add to their disappointment, their agony, their physical or other challenges. I mean, that, that must have been a tough one for you emotionally, mentally, to take on yeah it, yes it was uh and uh as i think we'll end up talking about my i now have personal <laughs> empathy with these people that i didn't at the time but but yes it, so this was our first therapeutic study and and it was in people who were depressed or anxious because of this cancer diagnosis and how can one not have empathy for that uh in particularly in our our culture i mean that is kind of the deepest existential question isn't it what what hap- what what are we doing here what happens when we die and that's a source of tremendous fear for some for some people uh, other others not depending on what your worldview beliefs are but for many it is and it's a completely understandable one. And so, I, again, this was our first therapeutic study, and I thought, do we know what we're doing here? And, uh, and, and we need to be careful because whatever that is like to lean into that question about the, the termination of life, uh, we wouldn't want to make that worse in people. Uh, but there had been an older literature from the 60s that suggested that this kind of intervention would be helpful. And uh, and it turned out in, indeed it was. And, uh, wow. and so and I how? was relieved as that study uh, progressed. There was uh, actually, at, at, when we initiated the study, we did so at, a, at our highest dose of psilocybin. And we just had a couple of people whose response you know, wasn't as good as I would have hoped, and I and so I worried about that. And we we dropped the dose of psilocybin down. I don't know now, in retrospect, whether that was necessary or not, or whether I was just being overly cautious. But when you're when you're working with new compounds under new conditions, I'm going to default to being overly cautious. And in any case, the dose we gave produced these profound effects. Most people having these remarkable experiences, m- many of them reporting a changed sense of uh, of death and and what that and what that means. And I think that came out differently for different people. Some people put it into a religious context, and they and they now were sure that they would encounter an afterlife Uh, other people didn't put it in to a religious context per se uh, yet they felt that there was something uh, that existed after death 
um, and some just felt that there was a there was some kind of benevolence in in this whole in this whole story that we're involved with. There's some beauty and elegance in this, and dying was okay. What I think the I think what I found to be most touching about the outcomes of of those uh, patients and their stories is very often they came out of these experiences in this really uplifted state in which they ended up consoling their caretakers. I mean, there was a role reversal. They had family members who were really worried about them and wanted to do right by them. And they almost, they, a number of them just turned that back on their caretakers and were providing assurances to their caretakers that this is sad. I'm I'm going to leave. <laughs> I have to go. Uh, but it's okay. And it's beautiful. And everything's going to be all right. And to hear, hear those stories, I mean, it still kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up because of the emotional significance that had for everyone that they came in contact to with. Oh my God, I was tearing up just thinking about that. What a what a difference and what a tool in the arsenal, you know, to help these people who are suffering so much. I, I'm so moved by it. I want to get it from my mom. She doesn't have cancer, thank God. But I, I would love to just see how it changes life perspective for her. You know, I just, this could be used on, you know, far and wide for anybody who's suffering or feeling down or you know, facing end of life issues. And that does lead me to your story, Roland, which is, you know, I said, and I know you don't look at it like this, but I said to my team, um, I'm really not looking forward to the part where we have to break the audience's hearts and tell them what's going on with Roland because that study on the terminally ill cancer patients would become relevant to you personally. What what happened? How did you find out that you, you have cancer? Yeah. So uh, this was about 14 months ago. I went in for a routine screening colonoscopy, believing myself to be completely healthy. I take care of myself. I watch my diet. I exercise uh, and came out with, in short order, a stage four cancer diagnosis that's been uh, resistant to treatment. So, so, (laughs) So the irony is that all of a sudden I was in the position uh, of the patients that I'd spent so much time with and talking about their views on what death and dying is about. Oh. But uh, but Megan, the astonishing thing about this is that it's, uh, rather than being depressed and anxious for me, it's I consider the whole thing to be a blessing. And it's been this just, remarkable experience of joy and gratitude. I, and I don't quite know how I came to have this experience, but I but I, I have an idea. Um, you know, I had a long history of practicing meditation. And so I was accustomed to going in in interrogating my thoughts, feelings, emotions as they come up. And and this is what you learn to do in meditation. Although me, uh, I don't want to soft pedal it, meditation's hard because most people, and and I was one of those initially, get very discouraged very quickly, uh, feeling that there there's nothing here or it's, or that they're a failure. And and the, so it's tricky working with meditation. But but what one comes to learn is that uh, you don't need to identify with the narrative self, the voice in your head. You don't actually need to identify with emotions or feelings that come up. That 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 the voice in your head, those feelings uh, exist within this kind of larger context, this larger frame of mind. And if you don't identify with that, then it's going to pass. It, and and uh, but if you lock into a narrative story about what's happening, then it's that becomes your world. It's like the addicted cigarette smoker identifying as addicted, and then they are. 
And if you identify as being anxious or depressed, that's where you find yourself. So with the diagnosis, I uh, at first, there was this sense of it was just unreal. I, this, it was just a bad dream, <laughs> frankly. Uh, and my wife and I cried uh, a lot, uh, but it was confusing. And then this happened just over a few days. And then I went through and started sorting through kind of the emotional states that would emerge. And, you know, one would be anxiety or depression, you know, or resentment uh, toward a medical system that maybe put me at a screening interval that was inappropriate, you know, or or going to combat with the cancer or denial. It's not really happening. And none of those struck me as being pleasant places to be. Uh, and uh, and so that's, I, I really didn't want to go there. What, what I recognized was that, that this was a springboard into gratitude, just gratitude for the preciousness of our lives. And it's something we, we all know, right? This is something really remarkable that we find ourselves as these highly evolved sentient creatures walking the earth's surface, talking in the middle of culture, you know, but what's going on here? How did this, what's the backstory behind this? How do we account for this? How do we account for the fact that we can even be aware that we're aware, that we know that we know something? And for me, when you contemplate that, gratitude comes up. This is, life is a precious gift. It's precious beyond belief. And so my choice then became to deeply practice gratitude and use the the so-called problems that arise from a diagnosis like that. And they're plenty of opportunities with surgery and chemotherapy and all the side effects and dealing with the medical uh, profession. You could have <laughs> all kinds of opportunities to collapse into different states, but they can be used in, in a way that just reflects back as a reminder that each moment is precious. Each moment is unretrievable. And that's what this <laughs> 14 months is been like for me. So it's a gift. It's a blessing. And and uh, my wife and I often talk about what a tragedy it would have been had I just been run over by a bus on that day that I was walking out to that screening colonoscopy appointment, because I wouldn't have had this. I I thought I was pretty awake to the joy and miracle of of life before this, but it's much more so now. And so I'm moved to talk about it just because uh, I think in principle, we can all wake up much more than we are. And I want to encourage people to do that absent a terminal diagnosis. Mm. Roland, thank you for sharing that. My God, I'm, I'm definitely, I feel more emotional about it than than you do, but I know you've dealt with it. And there's so much wisdom in what you just said there. The the thought, uh, we don't need to identify with thoughts or emotions as they arise. That What a concept. So it's there. The anger, maybe a feeling of betrayal, of getting gypped, of why me, what could have been. Like they're, they're marching by you like ants in a parade, but you well, but don't not have only to that, accept them. Yeah, I mean, you can you can take advantage of that. So if you know, so so anger comes up, right? And and kind of the the immediate response, if you kind of query what's going on, is yeah, you want to get back, and you know, however you're going to manifest that. But but there's energy that comes, and if you go inside and kind of query that, uh, you can recognize that there's all this energy and you, you've given it a label of anger and you you don't have to act on that. In fact, you can just repurpose that toward gratitude like, yeah, oh my God, I'm here. <laughs> I mean, why? And, and it's not going to serve me to 
to act on that anger. I mean, sometimes it will. I mean, you know, some we we have these conserved uh, evolutionary conserved tendencies, you know, for some good reasons, but but a lot of times within our culture, you know, we're uh, acting out primitive responses that just don't serve us or the people we're reacting to optimally. And so that's So wait, so let me just the, restate that. So make sure I understand it. So you're so if in my analogy of the little ants are walking by with anger, bitterness, you know, betrayal, it's not that you're saying, I reject you and I reject you and I reject you. It's that you're changing what's written on their sign. You're saying I'll take all the energy on your sign of that very big emotion that is available to me. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna on the opposite side of that sign, I'm gonna write gratitude. And I'm going to use all that energy to funnel toward that. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I'll take it one step forward. You can you can thank the little ant or whatever the condition is, you know, for providing you this further wake up call. You're just not going to go with the message that's on their side. Mm. Oh, that's extraordinary. <clears throat> I, that's so helpful. I love the way you're saying that. So, did you have to? Because uh, I know we never sort of got to the point where in the midst of your research at some point, you did try um, the, the, the psilocybin in a, in a serious way, not, not the sort of cursory, you know, 20s things you mm-hmm. talked about. Did you need to do it again, Roland, you know, after the diagnosis? Did you, did you choose to do it again? Or was, were the earlier experiences enough for you? Yeah. L- well, let's see. So the, the way I handled the diagnosis uh, initially, um, and then, of course, the, because I'm known for the psychedelic research, people ask me, oh, are you going to take psilocybin? And, and in fact, that was the last thing in the world I, I wanted to do. I, I felt that I was in, th- in this altered state, <clears throat> more awake, alive, joyful, with greater equipoise than I'd ever been before. <clears throat> And I actually thought, no, why, <laughs> why would I ever want to uh, disturb that? So, so, you know, but also at that point, I'd done a lot of meditation and I did have some interesting psychedelic experiences that may have informed my ability to respond like that. But I wasn't, I wasn't drawn to that. I, I have subsequently, since the diagnosis, uh, had one experience with a with a psychedelic, in which I made which I just used it for some self inquiry that was was very interesting, uh, but uh, it doesn't explain much about what I'm encountering now, how I'm responding to the diagnosis and and my eagerness to uh, uh, to communicate about that. Uh, including wanting to launch a whole research program that speaks to this very issue. Mm. The the study you did on cancer patients showed large decreases in depression, anxiety, death anxiety, and increases in feelings of quality of life, meaning of life, optimism, sustained after a six-month follow-up. So now for you, you don't sound fearful, death, anxiety. You certainly don't seem to have that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think a lot of us who don't have your diagnosis have that. And I wonder, how is it possible, right? Like I, people of faith often say they don't fear death, but how is it possible that actually facing it, you don't fear it? Is that a connection to a higher power? Like what, what's, the, what's going on in your mind as you think yeah. about it? <laughs> so I... Uh, so I'm, I, I, yeah, I don't know how unique I am, but I'm a scientist. I'm a skeptic. It's really hard to get me to say that I believe in anything, right? Because the very <laughs> nature of science is to be skeptical and want proof. Um, and so I, I don't know and don't have any strong beliefs about what happens uh, when we die because I'm bred within a scientific reductionistic tradition, um, I'm inclined to put low probability on afterlife, at least as it's described uh, 
very often in in uh, beautiful uh, religious uh, traditions in which you're uh, you know assured this glorious coming together with family and friends and and the divine uh, and 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 I I I, can't, I I I certainly would put that at low probability, but I also as a skeptic, uh, I <laughs> if someone said that that was a certainty, I would be skeptical of that. So there's, <laughs> so so I do maintain, although albeit a very low probability of of something that survives death. I do remain intensely curious about that, you know, and it can be very low probability uh, to still maintain that curiosity, and and so so that certainly is at play, and then I but you know more more than that, it's the gratitude practice, the leaning into the preciousness of life. It just means every day every moment every minute is is one that we need to choose how we're going to show up whether we're going to be present with that but um but all of the magnificence of of this entire adventure that we all as sentient creatures find ourselves in is in principle available to us every moment if we allow ourselves to stay awake to that. And I think that's that's what I want people more than anything to do, to contemplate that. And what I really want is ultimately, and I don't want to sound like Timothy Leary, but I, but I, I, I think it's attainable eventually, and this is going to be multi-generational, that the our cultures are going to awake to this and that we need to see and feel at a deeper level the magnificence of what this process is and at some fundamental level we're all in this together we're all in, we share the same dilemma right of uh, the one thing that we know to be true is that we're conscious that's probably the only thing we can affirm. And I can affirm it for me. I can't affirm it for you or anyone else. And we're all stuck in that that very real situation, unless you haven't thought about it very deeply. You know, and for, so from that, there's this sense of compassion that opens up, at least for me, for everyone. I mean, the, I see everyone's, or most of us are stuck in some ways. And in principle, that's unnecessary. And so the long-range vision is that if we're going to survive as a species, and I, and I do mean survive as a species, we've got to figure this out before we terminate ourselves uh, mm -hmm. by all these existential uh, opportunities, be it bioweaponry or nuclear war or AI risk or, you know, what have you. And I'm not, you know, and I'm not thinking that that's around around the corner next week or tomorrow, and it can get overblown for sure. But in the longer run, we've got to sort this out. Uh, and wouldn't it be lovely if we could? Wouldn't it? I mentioned Steve Jobs. I'm thinking of him now as I listen to you, and also a man of science in a different way. And on his passing was reported to have said, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow, dying of pancreatic cancer. And I've always thought there could have been something, you know, for a man like that, that he was seeing and communicating in his own way back to us. And I, I believe it'll be there for you. And I believe it'll be there for me too. And I hope and I pray it'll be there for my, my family and me as, as well. What a remarkable hour. Roland, I'm so grateful to meet you. I feel so emotional. I, I don't, I don't want to lose you. Uh, so we cry for ourselves and we lean into gratitude that you've been here and that we got to meet you. And I, I send all my best and all my love to you and your wife and your family. Thank you. But I, but, <laughs> but I want to reflect that back on you. I want you to join me 
in the celebration of what you, what you have and what you what you bring and and lean into the incredible gift that we're given so thank you i'm going to work on that you've inspired me to work on that and maybe i'll swing by the clinic sometime very soon <laughs> <laughs> okay. all the best roland lots of love thank you for being here okay bye bye all right. And don't forget, folks, go to griffithsfund.org to support Roland. Tomorrow, don't miss the show. we got the EJs back on, Emily Jashinsky and Eliana Johnson. The ladies are always full of interesting things to say. Tomorrow will be no different. Uh, in the meantime, you can download the show and you can follow us on YouTube and you can go to megankelly.com if you want to register for our, our quick Friday email, which I think you'll enjoy. See you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>